Hello, hello everybody. Okay, welcome. I've been told that I can start already. So thank you all for attending this session. Um, as you know already, this is about running Postgres on Kubernetes. And the first thing I want to say is, is this something that makes sense? Let me ask you something. Please raise hands if you run databases on, ideally Postgres, by the way, on Kubernetes or Docker or another container environment. Who does that? Okay, let's, let's, this is a good one. In production, who runs databases on containers in production? I count maybe 10 hands. Well, if there's anything you're taking out home today, home or work, whatever, is that probably all of you want to do this. My recommendation is that Kubernetes should be the default way to running databases like Postgres. If you disagree, you're free to go already. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Um, so, of course, you're free to disagree anyway, but I'm gonna explain why, and actually, more than explaining, I'm gonna try to demonstrate why. It is hard in one hour to demonstrate why, but honestly, I've got like seven or eight slides, so if I cannot demonstrate this, you're gonna get bored soon, and we can go for another coffee, because I'm not gonna do it in an hour, right? So, who likes demos? Yeah? Because almost everything is gonna be demo, which means everything is gonna fail. <laughs> You're gonna laugh at me, but that's okay. I'm ready, I can bear with that. So, who am I? Compulsory slide, blah, 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 but, but I mean, you can read it. But basically, I am a person who likes to do research and innovation in databases. That means I come up with stupid ideas that almost never work. But sometimes, from time to time, some of them may actually work. Uh, I founded a company called Ongres, which is the short for on Postgres, and that should pretty much tell the story about everything that we do. And as I said, I work a lot on R&D. One of the software that we have created, the pure open source software, is a software for running, yeah, you guess it, Postgres on Kubernetes. I may make a small demo today about it, but just to showcase the capabilities and the advantage of running Postgres on Kubernetes. I also like to uh, contribute to the Postgres community, and I've been giving lots of talks. You can go to my website, here, this one, hd.es, where I have collected around 120 tech talks in the last decade with all the slides, videos, and all that. So there's a lot of content there if you want to check it out. And I founded also a nonprofit entity in Spain, Postgres Foundation. I'm also an Amazon hero and a few other things. But but basically, I like to do crazy stuff with Postgres. That's, that's the takeaway. So let's get started. There's a couple of topics I want to touch on here. First, a brief discussion about containers. What are containers? I, I'm not going to do like a one-on-one -on, -one on containers. Just basic concepts. Then we'll do a quick demo on containers. We'll switch to Kubernetes. We'll explain why Kubernetes. Why do you want to run databases on Kubernetes? Make a demo of doing Postgres on Kubernetes the hard way. Um, and then we'll switch to doing the easy way. And everything else is going to be demo. By the way, feel free to ask any question anytime. I'm happy to be interrupted any second. I'm going to be interrupted by the demo because it's going to fail anyway, so not a big deal. All right. So when I say talk about running databases on Kubernetes or containers, a lot of people say, no. Why do you do that? This is dangerous, right? You, you, your database is going to vanish eventually, and your data is going to disappear, right? And I don't think this is the case. So actually, let me already go to the demo. Let's, let's, let's make a test. Let's see if the database vanishes or not, right? So uh, I'm going to use Podman, which is uh, probably you'll know Docker. Podman is a probably safer alternative to Docker. So I'm just going to run Podman, and let's run a container. So let's run a container. Let's call it uh, PG. Let's say that I want it to be deleted when it finishes. Um, let's run it detached mode. And so I'm, I need to, I'm gonna run a Postgres container. The CC, uh, this is actually the official Postgres image. I need to pass an environment variable which is post, 
press password. I don't care about it, let's call it A, so that it will run. And this is just how the image is built. It's nothing special to containers. And this should get me, get me a Postgres. Oh, forget about that warning. Yep, okay, I got a container running. I can check it out. There we go. Yep, we have a Postgres. So let, let's let's see if we can connect to Postgres. So actually, can they say Podman exec t on container pg? I think I call it, and then let's say as user Postgres and run psql. And uh, sorry, I should have been there. Okay, looks like I've got a Postgres. So let's create a database. And let's exit, so all is good. Now, people say, yeah, containers disappear, vanish away, and all these things, so let's simulate the situation. Um, just for completeness, I just uh, create a database called A. Okay, so now let's say Podman delete PG to simulate um, Okay, let's stop it first, not big deal. So let's stop, okay. Let's not say our container failed. Well, I could actually force that. Actually, let's force that. So someone deletes my container, something fails. And of course, it doesn't matter because containers are easy to restart, right? I can restart it pretty much uh, the same way I did it before. And then I connect to my container again, and I list the databases, and of course nothing is lost, right? Everything is there. Hold on, so it just takes a while to start. It's not immediate, a few seconds, and it's not there. Oh my god, so containers are dangerous then. <laughs> Obviously you know what happened, right? <laughs> Anyone can tell me? Yeah? I start a different container. What else? Yeah, I mean, this, yes. But uh, later on, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna keep the database there. Yet starting a different container. I didn't create a volume. Okay, so this is interesting, right? Um, so let's look about a little bit about what is a container before fixing this problem. A lot of people believe that containers are micro VMs. Well, actually, micro VMs already exist. So maybe they are nano VMs or, well, you never. You, you get it, right? And the reality is that no, there's no virtualization. A container is just a process, or technically a process hierarchy, running on your host machine. A process, like, you know, Postgres. You run Postgres, create some processes. That could also be technically a container. Now, it has some layers, think of an onion, around it that isolate. The kernel creates a few layers to isolate this process hierarchy from other processes in the whole system, such as a networking space, so a container gets its own network space, can has its own IP address, right? This you can do also outside, but there's an isolation layer. It also gets a process space. So actually, you can only see yourself running inside of the container. Whereas you're running on the host system and you could see all the processes running there. Actually, I can show this very easily because now I'm running Postgres and if I list Postgres processes, well, actually, I've got tons of Postgres running here, but um, we could see the process of the container. I don't know which one is it here, but it's probably this one. This one is coming from the container. So I can see what is running inside of the container because it's just a process running on the host system, right? And there's a third layer, which is a storage, file system namespace. So the kernel is capable of creating an illusion that I have a dedicated file system for me inside of the container. But this file system is ephemeral. It is attached to the life of the container so that when my container disappears, the file system disappears, which is what essentially what we're really all thinking of, right? We're all right. Okay, understood. But then, how can we run a database on a container if the file system vanishes? Well, luckily, there is the option to set 
external storage. And once we set external storage to the container, this external storage can be essentially anything. It can be a local disk, it can be a network disk, it can be anything. Now we're going back to square one. This is the very same thing as you're running if you're running without containers, essentially. You have a process hierarchy, and then you mount a disk. For example, it could be a network disk, it could be a highly reliable disk coming from a cloud vendor. You attach it to the container, and you're done. You're writing to a fast performance, durable disk whose life cycle is separated from the container life cycle. So whenever you hear this is dangerous because containers disappear, well, the disk doesn't disappear. As long as you use external storage, you're good to go. So let's continue with this quick small demo. Let's actually fix this, right? So let's um, kill this container, uh, PG. Actually, if I list Postgres now, you see that there is no such instance that we had before because it's, it's disappeared. It's assigned to, to be uh, uh, killed, right? So Now, what I can do is when I launch the container, I can set up a directory. For example, I can, I can create a, a local directory on my, on my computer, let's say um, PG data. And when I run the container, I can say, hey, you know what? I'm going to mount a volume. I'm going to make some disk, re local or remote, available to the container. I'm going to mount it inside, but it's going to be external. So I'm going to say this PG data, I, need, I want to mount it on the directory that the container expects to find, or to create the Postgres directory, which is bar leave Postgres. SQL data, if I'm not mistaken. So if I do things right, and let's actually check the logs, then, oh, yep, looks like database started. Then let's uh, connect to it, as we did before. Let's create a database, call A. Let's destroy the container forcibly. No, sorry about that. Mm. Let's recreate the container, but passing the same PG data directory. And now let's see if our database persisted. Now it did, right? So this is how you can do storage with containers. And this leads us to the uh, conclusion that because a container is just a process wrapped on some isolation layers, Whatever works for a bare metal or process running on a VM, doesn't matter. The same you can do with containers. So don't, don't trust these ideas that containers vanishes and databases vanishes. Don't trust the idea that there's a performance degradation for running on a container. There is if you run on the isolated ephemeral uh, file system presented to the container. But if you're running an external disk, it's an external disk. You'll get the performance you get with it. Okay, by the way, this demo and the demo I'm gonna following, it's available online. If you wanna check it out while on, while on the way, it's on my personal GitLab. Uh, you can find also on my Twitter. And I'm just uh, gonna be following some steps here, as for, for the record. I'm just gonna keep it loaded here. And so here you have similar commands to what essentially I'm, I'm, I'm writing here today. Okay, so let's talk about Kubernetes. First of all, probably you're familiar with what is Kubernetes, but let me explain it very briefly for completeness. Kubernetes is an orchestration engine. And what does it mean, orchestration engine? Is it playing music or what? Well, Kubernetes is just a way of what I've been doing on my laptop is just to schedule some containers on my laptop. What if I had a pool of servers where I don't care about the shape of those servers, the amount of CPU, RAM they have. I say, ah, give me 16 nodes, and I want to run workloads on them. I want to run containers on them. But if I say, hey, run this container and attach this disk, and then coordinate with this another container, where they're going to run? Well, that's what Kubernetes does. 
If I say, also give me a volume out of this storage pool, which can be a network disk and a cloud infrastructure, where it's going to run, Kubernetes will take care of it. So it's an API where I can send commands saying, run containers, create disks, attach them, create services, which are essentially like load balancers. And that's a lot of magic behind the scenes for this to work without me having to worry where things are scheduled, where they are running, if a container dies, could be automatically restarted, and providing me very high-level primitives to run workloads. This is extremely powerful. So, if this is Kubernetes, and it's something that can run on almost essentially any cloud or on-prem infrastructure, what are the reasons to run databases on Kubernetes? For me, the most important one boils down to one word, automation. Automation and then automation. Kubernetes is an API. It makes infrastructure programmable. With API calls, I can create compute, running workloads. I can create networks. And I can create storage. I can manage everything. But on top of that, I can create my own things on Kubernetes. I can create my own objects on Kubernetes, which will do things in a different way. And I'll be able to automate things in a way that has not been done before. And I'll try to demo today if we have enough time. But the so-called day two operations, when you run Postgres, you run vacuums, right? You do repacks on your database to remove bloat, don't you? You probably run benchmarks. You run minor version upgrades, major version upgrades. You do all these operations, and probably you do them today manually. Those days are over. With Kubernetes, all these operations can be fully automated. Just click a button, you will get them done. This is even more automation than you get on managed cloud services. And this can all be done because it's just an API that is programmable. So this is the main reason for me to run databases on Kubernetes. That's why I say, by default, you should be running your database on Kubernetes. But if you're still not convinced, the second one is cost. You really can get your cost down by running your databases on Kubernetes, and I'm going to show you how. And then on top of that, you've got environment portability. Because Kubernetes is a uniform environment, you code against this API, and then you deploy workloads anywhere. This could be one cloud. This could be on-prem. And essentially, if you want to move from on-prem to the cloud, from the cloud to another cloud, from the cloud to on-prem, whatever combination you think of, maybe you don't even need to change your code. And if you do, it's just a few annotations, metadata on some YAML files. Now, when we think about deploying Postgres, actually, wow, well, this is very simple. I just deployed a container with Postgres a few minutes ago. It took me a few seconds, right? Would you deploy this in production? Well, probably no, right? Even if I'm using a network volume, because that Postgres is a single instance. It's not highly available, right? If it fails, well, I'm down. So probably you need a, highly, a, a, high, a tool for high availability, something like Patroni. But then, would you deploy that to production? Well, I wouldn't, because you don't have a connection pooler. And you deploy Postgres with a connection pooler in front, don't you? Well, most of the times, if you don't, you should. So you need a connection pooler. But would you deploy that to production? Well, I wouldn't, because you don't have backups. right? So probably you need a tool for doing backups, for managing backups that are life cycle, to delete backups after a certain period of retention time. Would you deploy that to production? I guess you get the point. Still probably no, because you don't have monitoring. You probably need, need a tool for monitoring. And then probably you also need a tool for managing all these components, because are you going to write all the config files and you know whatnot? This takes a lot of effort, even for seasoned Postgres administrators. So we actually did some internal numbers, and they might be totally wrong, on how much effort would it take an expert Postgres DBA to set up all these components to manage even logs? Do you, do you deploy 10 instances of Postgres, and then if something happens, you go SSH to each and every one to look at the logs, to parse them, grab them, awk, to find the, the, the issue you're trying to look into 10 times? So there's a lot of things to do. So we've run some internal numbers 
and how, how long would it take an expert DBA to set up all these components with automation, something like Ansible, to deploy it on a given environment. And if you look at all these tasks, and again, this is our estimation, it could take anywhere between 86, let's say 90 hours and 250 hours to set up all this environment. And then you will go to another environment and you'll have to essentially repeat it because this code is not very portable. Each environment is different to each other. And this is what we've been doing at Ongres many, many, many years. Up to the point where we realized that if there would be a uniform environment where we could reproduce this, then this cost would go down significantly. And this environment happens to be Kubernetes. So now, with a proper tool to run this on Kubernetes, our estimate is that between four and 16 hours of a CKA, a CKA is a certified Kubernetes administrator, doesn't need to be certified, essentially someone who knows Kubernetes basics, not even Postgres expert, just Kubernetes basics, in between four to 16 hours can deploy a fully production ready Postgres clusters. Actually, I'm gonna try to deploy a production ready Postgres cluster in 20 minutes. It is not exactly the same you would do in a real production environment, but we might go get close to that. Any questions or you wanna see the demo? Ah, ah, demo, okay, 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 fair enough, thank you. So, uh, two quick demos here. The first one is called Kubernetes the hard way. And this is not my title. You probably know of half, half heard of Kelsey Hightower, a very well seasoned speaker who has created a GitHub repo called Postgre uh, Kubernetes the hard way. And this is meant to install Kubernetes you know, from, from scratch. It is, uh, yeah, admittedly hard. But this is not what you typically need to do. Typically, you're gonna, or I recommend, that you use a package distribution of Kubernetes or a cloud service. So you can use a Kubernetes on a given cloud. I'm gonna use this here today for the demo, so I'm gonna be using Kubernetes. In this case, I've been running demos on different cloud environments. Today, I'm gonna run it on Oracle Cloud, um, which is interesting because we're gonna run Postgres, Postgres on Oracle. Um, but uh, it's just a managed service for Kubernetes, right? And first, I'm going to try to reproduce the demo we did with containers, just the Kubernetes. It is similar, but not exactly the same. But it's a hard way, because if I want to build all the stack that I mentioned before, all this stack, it will take still a lot of effort. It is simpler than, on, let's say, on-prem, but it still will take a lot of effort. And then I'll introduce the concept of operators and look at one and see how easy all these things will be. So, um, let's go for the demo. I have here a Kubernetes cluster. I use kubectl, which is a tool to operate with Kubernetes. And let's uh, first of all look at the cluster info. So we have the cluster running. Uh, I hope the demo will not fail. I'm running over Wi-Fi and the connection is going right now to the US. Sorry about that. But yeah, it's going slow, I see. Actually, I think um, I should connect the the Wi-Fi. Sorry about this. Anyone can help me remember the password for this? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. PG. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's see if this helps the connection go faster. Let's call it, cancel this and okay. Worst case, I've got a local one as a backup, but. <laughs> oh, hold on, this might be also. Okay, okay, okay. I know I know the problem. I need to re-authenticate. This is easy to do. Yeah, I was here. It's okay. Yep, 
your tokens expire, so you need to re-authenticate. That should be it. Okay, so with a bit of luck, we're back on back in the game. Okay, this is better. Good note. Good news. And so I have I have three nodes. So again, this is a Kubernetes cluster. This is running on Oracle Cloud, and there is essentially nothing installed here. So I just created a cluster. And I'm going to list the pods, pods are the workloads running, and should be come up only with, with uh, system pods, which is what essentially is required to create. So there's nothing here. Now, I'm going to go to the source code that I have here, Kubernetes the hard way, and I'm going to create a basic pod. To deploy things on Kubernetes, you typically use a YAML file, and, and well, this is the way to do it. It's not very different from what we did before uh, in, in with just containers, I am going to create an object of type pod. Pod is the workloads. And I'm going to give it a name, pod PG. I specify the image. This is the name of the container. Within a pod, I could have more than one container. This is uh, very actually usual and useful. And I just pass the same environment variable I was using before. So it's pretty much the same effort. And to, in order to deploy this, I can just say kubectl apply, apply this f and this YAML file. And this will get the pod created, and I'll get a Postgres running in a few seconds. I can actually do cube. Um, there's a bit of lag. OK, let's hope. Otherwise, I'll switch to the local one for the other part of the demo, because I think otherwise it's going to take a bit, little bit of time. Yeah, it's definitely take, think, taking a while. Well, um, this is going to deploy the container. It's going to run Postgres on it. And I'll, I'll, I'll just be able to use it, right? So if I say, uh, actually, I can now kubectl exec on pod pg and run shell in this case, I should be able to access the container and verify that Postgres is there. If I connect to Postgres user, here we have my Postgres, right? Now, this container that I run here is essentially suffering the same problem that I didn't specify the disk volume it's going to use. So if I kill it, if I do kubectl, well, actually, I can kill it manually. So I say, if I say delete pod pg, then this container is going to disappear, and I will lose my data. So how do I use data in Kubernetes? Pretty much the same concept. I have to create a volume. So here I have two alternatives. One is to create um, a pod that will use a, a local path. So this is something that I will create uh, similar to what I did before. I create a volume here, which uses, uses host path, which is a folder within the file system. And I mount it here. Now, this file system is not my laptop. This is the file system of the node where the container will be scheduled. So it's totally remote. It's going to be on, on, on OCI, running on OCI, right? Is this a recommended approach? Probably not, because if the node dies, my data dies, right? But this is one option. And um, it should work as is. So if I delete, I apply this, it will create. Uh, this pod with a persistent file system on the node. So it's not totally fault tolerant, um, but oh, it complained about something. Demo effect. This is interesting. But in any case, actually, what I wanted to show you is how to create a real volume. So honestly, I'm not going to care a little bit about, uh, completely about this. So let's actually look at how to create a volume in Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, uh, when you want to create a volume, first you create, oh, yes. It failed? Oh, really? Ah, even easier. Well, actually, because of the lag, I don't want to, to spend a lot of time on this. Thank you for that. But, um, but I, while this works, I want to. Uh, move on to the to the other example which is to create the volume so as i was saying in kubernetes when you want to create a volume first you want you create a handle to a volume a resource reservation for a volume looks like a bit of any direction but it makes a lot of sense in reality which is called a pvc persistent volume claim so i claim that i want one gigabyte 
out, out of a storage class. So what is a storage class? When you define the storage, you can create disks, uh, they can be provisioned by the cloud directly, they can be software defined storage where they pull the storage of individual nodes and you group them together virtually by a software that is running and does this job. You can do anything you want. And then once you have defined this, you assign it a name. That's a storage class name. There's typically one by default. Um, in this case, actually, there's not this one default, but uh, you specify a name and then you say, I want to claim up to one gigabyte of storage from this storage pool. In the case where we are running, actually, this is called, uh, I'm going to list them. Uh, sorry. So let's delete the previous one anyway, because it's going to be handful to do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, we can get the storage classes that we have here, and we'll see that there's one called OCI and one called OCI BV. So let me actually edit this file. We're going to call this OCI BV block volume, right? And this should, be, uh, should allow us to create this this PVC, persistent volume claim. Once this is done, I will create a volume and the pod. So, ah, okay, this is interesting. Let me show you this later, but I'll be able to do this. So I'll be able to create my container, also mounting this volume and uh, referencing the persistent volume claim that, that I just created. And this is all that I need to do to create a container running on Kubernetes against a, a, a volume that is going to be persistent, that is going to be durable, right? Now, yes, this was created. So now if I do kubectl get pvc, I'll be able to show this persistent volume claim that is here, list that is pending because not assigned yet to a pod. Now, I'm going to show first that this is just a small tweak, but this is an example of the kind of things that in reality is also beautiful, but in reality there's a lot of work to do in between when you want to transform this into a production stack. Which is when I mount this file system, it's going to create a lost and found directory because it's format X4 by default and always create this lost and found. And this is something that will, Postgres will not allow. So before creating the pod with Postgres, I'm going to create just a busy box container so that I can log in and delete this directory. Otherwise, things will not work. So let me do this. But you see, I'm just mounting here the same volume. So I'm going to create a busy box container running a dummy command just so that I can execute commands inside of the container and affect this volume. Well, creating this is as easy as I was doing before. Apply and, uh, and the file. Yes, I need to run this on this shell. So, uh, and this will allow me to log into the container. Let's uh, see, box, run a shell. I need to wait until this works, of course. Was it called busy box, by the way? Yeah. Maybe it's not ready yet. Yeah, we need to wait a bit. OK, so in any case, what I'll do now is just that when the volume is created, by default, it's going to be formatted. Uh, X4 is going to create a, this process creates a directory called lost and found. And Postgres does not like to initialize this speech data inside of with this directory being present there. So I'm just going to delete it and then create Postgres. Normally, you would do this in Kubernetes with an init container. So you see now we're going to start creating containers and init containers to support this, and then we'll talk about sidecars. So now I should be able to connect. It's definitely lagging a bit. So I'm going to start running all the commands ahead of time so that I'm going to be trapped on this. And now I could probably do uh, this.
yeah, this directory. And then I can now kubectl delete pod visit box. Because the volume remains there, even if I delete the container, I can later access it. And now I will access it from the Postgres container. Which essentially is very similar to what we had before, right? kubectl apply this f and this file. Okay. I could go on and on and on uh, showing how to step by step add here connection pooling. For this, I will need to add another container to this pod description. Okay, that's great. And uh, I could then add monitoring, backups, and all these things, but of course, we don't have time for all this. This will take a lot of effort. I mean, probably less than doing it manually, but it's a lot of effort. Fortunately, Kubernetes has a functionality called operators. And operators allow you to program these operations or someone to program these operations for you. So before that, let me just uh, double check that we're good here. Just to double check that uh, this Postgres container with the volume was properly created right now. And indeed, if I connect to a shell here on pod PG, I should be able to connect to Postgres. And now this is persistent because it's going against the volume. And well, I mean, we can go on over, but I want to move to the next demo, but this is already persistent, right? Well, okay, let's do that. You need to trust me. So if I uh, delete this pod, and then I recreate it, the data will, will remain there. And so this is, again, what you would do a bit the hard way. It's not really hard, but, but you need, still need to work a lot to build all this stack of components, right? OK, and let's recreate it. So after this, and I'm going to start creating some commands because I see normally they'll take like one minute. They're going to take a little bit more here because of the network, probably. So I'm going to start running them soon. But the idea is that operators uh, leverage the Kubernetes capability of creating your own custom objects. Here, I've shown the object pod and the object persistent volume claim. Those are predefined by Kubernetes. But the good thing is that you can create your own object. You can create an object called Postgres server. And then you can define the properties in the YAML that you like to see there. And then you write a software that reads these properties and takes actions. For example, when it reads that you want to create a two replicas, Postgres cluster, then it goes on and behind the scenes create all these pods and all these volumes and these sidecars and all the things that you need so that you don't need to do that making installation of a Postgres whole stack very simple. So just to finish this part of the demo, let's connect back to the database. I have recreated, deleted the pod, recreated it. And now if I go back, then the database it remains there. So all is good. We can finish this part. Obviously, if there's any question, uh, I'm happy to, to take it. Otherwise, we're going to move to the uh, demo of one of these operators. And also, let's delete the PVC. Well, we can do this later, because it's going to take a while. OK, so um, to move on to the next part of the demo, I'm going to be using one, um, one operator that we've built is fully open source and it's called Stackgres. The name comes from stack of components that you need on top of Postgres. All that I mentioned before, the P connection pooling, high availability, monitoring, backups, etc. that's a stack of components. And we claim that you need all this to run Postgres in production. So this is an operator or a platform to run Postgres and Kubernetes that brings everything done for you. So essentially, you don't need to worry about any of these things. What I'm going to follow now is just 
going to the documentation and to the tutorial. So you can also run this at home on your own environment and, and uh, there's no secret trick that I'm gonna be running. So first of all, uh, let me install a dependency that is optional because it also includes monitoring. I'm gonna install a monitoring stack before. We don't need to do this, but uh, it's cheap. Actually, it's free because it's open source, right? So let me uh, do this. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna create a namespace. Namespace are like schemas in Postgres, where we separate logically the workloads, right? So I'm gonna create a monitoring namespace, then I'll create a stackress namespace for stackress itself. And I'm going to install the stack. Actually, I'm gonna install a slightly different version. Yeah, this one is good. I'm just going to install a specific version of the of the stack because there is a there is a new version which introduces a non-compatible change. This I don't know. This normally takes one minute. Probably will take a little bit more. So while this installs, I'll I'll keep explaining what's what's the plan here. So as I said, the goal here is to install um, first the monitoring stack, which is standard from Prometheus. So this will install Prometheus. Grafana and Alert Manager. And then we're going to install Stackress itself. The way to install Stackress will also create a namespace, as we can see here on the screen. Oh, actually, let me make the font a bit bigger. And then I'm going to type this, this command. Looks a bit long, but in reality, it's just a single command. And with this command, I'm going to do two things. One is pass a few parameters that I need to pass to integrate with the whole monitoring stack. This is something you need to do only once in your life, right? Um, and this will create uh, uh, the capability to even inject custom dashboards in Grafana that are created for you, specific Postgres dashboards. Let's see how this is going, by the way. Yeah, I think it's gonna take a while. And then it is also gonna create a load balancer. This is another beauty about stack, uh, sorry, Kubernetes, is that uh, just by programmatically defining a few JAML files, then you can create components, which are, for example, load balancer. And I'm gonna use this load balancer to be created automatically to expose a web console, because Stackrest comes by default with a fully featured web console, which you can use to manage everything. So then, once this is created, I am going to be switching back and forth from the command line to the web console to show that it doesn't matter what you do on each one, everything will appear in the other environment. Ooh, this is taking a while. Hmm. Well, you know what? We're gonna run this in parallel on my local environment. Uh, get context. And this is also the beauty of Kubernetes context. that we can even run it on your laptop. Okay, so here I have this context and I'm just gonna say the same. Create, get notes. In this case, I have only one note here, that's fine. But I'm just gonna uh, then install, create a namespace. Monitoring and I'm going to install this here. Actually, because I changed the context real time, I hope I didn't break this. <laughs> but here that I'm running uh, on local, I hope this will be faster. Okay, once this is done, how do we move on? What, what is the next step? How do we use this, this operator thing? So let's continue with the tutorial, uh, which I started here. And let's look at how to create a simple cluster. Okay. So I need to create a YAML file like this. Let me just move it to the console. Okay. And this is the, what is most relevant to me. This is all you need 
to create a Postgres cluster with this operator, with the Stackgres. Uh, what uh, 11, 10 lines of JAML code. What it does is take the opportunity that you can create these custom objects. So there's an SG cluster, as is a Stackgres. So you can create an SG cluster, which will create a Postgres cluster, and this is just this is just metadata in reality, right? This is just a JAML file. But the Stackgres software behind the scenes, when you create this object in Kubernetes, Kubernetes is going to call this software and it's going to tell, hey, the user wants to create an SG cluster. What does it mean? Well, Stackgres knows. And it's going to read this metadata and it's going to create whatever is necessary to satisfy this. And, and indeed, what is going to create? So it's going to create two instances, so two pods of Postgres with PG Bouncer, with an Envoy proxy, which is used to terminate as a cell and to send metrics to Prometheus without having to touch Postgres, with um, a volume of size five gigabytes, because we are using monitoring, it will also start sending metrics to Prometheus um, it will trigger default alerts on Alert Manager if some threshold is crossed. It will present all the metrics on the Grafana dashboards. I will have high availability, so if I kill one instance or dies, another one will be restored. You get the point, right? And it only takes 10 lines of JAML. And I can manage everything from a web console. And this is all thanks to this programmability of Kubernetes. And later on, we can evolve this a little bit to include automatic backups. I just need to provide an additional configuration. And I'll have essentially a production-ready cluster. Let's see if we are lucky enough that this command, oh my god, this is going so slow. What about this one? Yeah, this one also timed out. <laughs> Let's wait a little bit, but, or actually, let's try to go with without monitoring. Maybe we'll get some. Yeah, let's let's cancel this and remove monitoring. So in this case, I'll just remove actually all these commands that I don't need. Let's try to optimize the network time we have here, and just. Install a stackers. Okay, we'll do without monitoring for this demo. Sorry about that. Again, you can try this at home and you'll get the same effort. Okay, 10 minutes. So, uh, is it? Let's then switch to the other environment. Use context. And we're gonna need to cross fingers a bit that this will work on time. All right. So, so this is again. Let's look at the JAML, right? So this will, as I as I said, this will create the the class the two node cluster with uh, with uh, connection pooling with uh, high availability. With monitoring, no, because we, I just disabled this to go faster, but, but it should also do that, right? Now, if we want to make this a little bit more advanced, then we can look at how, for example, customize a Postgres configuration. And to other customize a Postgres configuration, we leverage another object, which is called SD Postgres config. The good thing about this, this looks like a lot like PostgresQL.conf, right? But in reality, this is a strongly validated. If you put there an invalid parameter or a value out of range, it is gonna not let you create this connection, this configuration. And this configuration, you can reuse across multiple clusters. So you can share the configuration across multiple clusters. You may also customize a connection pooling configuration, uh, which is also here below. Um, connection pooling configuration. It's, it's a similar object, an SG pooling config. 
So you get probably the pattern here, right? We can create as many custom objects as we want. And with these custom objects, the software behind the scenes is going to act on them and it's going to create stuff. In this case, actually, this configuration is just metadata, but then I can assign to multiple clusters and say, you wanna, you're, you're going to use this Postgres configuration, you're going to use this connection pooling configuration, et cetera. But let's look at more, more advanced stuff, stuff. How do I create a backup, backup configuration? So I create yet another object like this. Let me just go to the part where we create the object. This one, let me just copy and show it on a shell so it'll be faster. Oh my God, this is my bad. Um, Stackress, sorry, forgot about that. And let's try this again. In the meantime, let me show you. So this is what I need to create a, a backup in Stackress. This, what essentially says, is that I'm going to use a storage, which could be any object storage available, and I specify a cron configuration for how frequently do I want the backups to be taken, after with, with what uh, periodic uh, time, and the retention, which means here I will only keep six of these backups at a, at a time. So it's going to automatically make the backups for me, and it's going to automatically delete the backups that are above the retention for me. And I just need to specify a certain configuration to access the, the, the cloud bucket or, or software emulated bucket that I'm using, right? What else? Let me check how this is going, by the way. Yeah, it's still running, right? Okay, let's, let's hope we'll get it. Then another feature that you can look into is use a distributed log. And this is another feature that is very unique to this software, to Stackress, which is a server for hosting Postgres logs. So the way this works is that Postgres logs are captured at every server, so every pod in Kubernetes, and send over the network to a central location. The central location is called a distributed log server. And to create one, I just need to execute this YAML. Specify the size and the name, and that's pretty much it. Then, when I create a cluster, I specify that I want to send the distributed logs to this distributed log server, and that's all that I need. Now, this distributed log server, funnily enough, is another Postgres server. We store the Postgres logs in Postgres which means that you can query the logs with SQL, which is extremely powerful. You don't need to worry about the volume because we use time scale, time series extension for Postgres to store the logs in an efficient way. And this is all transparent for you don't need to do anything. You don't even need to know they're even stored on Postgres. You can just go query them with SQL and all the logs from all the servers will be in a single location, perfectly structured in tables with columns that you can query with SQL. Or you can go on the web console, if I have time to demo it, and the logs will appear also on the log console. You can query them also from the web. But the interesting fact is that this, which is very complex process, very complex development, takes you seven lines of YAML. How are we doing? Not yet. All right. What else you can do here? Um, Extensions. One of the most interesting capabilities about the software is that we support the largest number of Postgres extensions available in the market. Postgres extensions on containers are a little bit hard because containers are meant to be immutable. They're based on an image. So if you want to support 150 extensions, how do you do that? You bundle all them into the container image. Well, how big is going to be that image? And how potentially unsafe is going to be that image? If only one of those extensions has a security vulnerability, then your software is vulnerable. And if only one of those extensions get once updated, how do you update it? You need to update the image. And to restart the image, you need to restart the container, which means restart your database, which means downtime. It's not nice. So we have created a mechanism unique to Postgres that 
loads extensions dynamically into the container. Because containers are ephemeral, we need to do this, do this all the time a container fails or is restarted or is created, but that's okay. It's taken care of for you. So when you start Postgres on Stackgres, you barely have any extension. But then you go to the YAML file, it would be something like this. Oh, by the way, this is, this is good news. And, oh, I, I deleted this, but, uh, the YAML file to install an extension is as simple as here, sorry, here, under the section Postgres, I add another field called extensions, and that's an array, and I type the name, for example, timescale db, and that's it, and it will appear dynamically. Any moment I edit the YAML file, I'll apply to Kubernetes, and it will appear, appear there. So actually, just because we have this, and I know I don't have much time left, but let me create a quick cluster. And yes. And hopefully in a few seconds, <laughs> probably a bit more here because of the connection, I will get a Postgres cluster with connection pooling and with a few other things created already for me. Right? They should be connecting on, actually, uh, yes. So there is creating already. And on the meantime, let me show you the web interface because with a bit of luck, we're gonna have time enough to show it. It's exposed on an external IP. So if I go here, I think I'm running out of time. Any questions? I'm gonna need to take a few questions at the exit. And this is the way to get the password, which is generated by default. Random password, very safe. And so if I connect to the web console, just to quickly show it to you, and we'll see the process of creating the, the server. This is all built in by default, comes by default. This is purely open source. There's nothing special that you need to do here. And I hope it's gonna load, I'll show it quickly. Any quick question? Uh, so would you say that uh, uh, Stackrest is a viable alternative to RDS and if so, uh, could you like make a comparison, like a feature comparison about what they have that Stackrest doesn't and vice versa? I think it's, it's more than a viable alternative. It's a, it's a fantastic alternative. Um, it has everything that RDS has, like automatic failover, automatic backups, automatic monitoring, automatic deployment, custom configurations, and all those things, plus many others that RDS doesn't, like availability of extensions. If you go to Stackrest extensions here, there is available like more than 150 extensions, whereas in RDS you'll get 60 or 70. Plus you can run it on AWS, Oracle Cloud, Google Cloud, on-prem, whatever you want. And the most important thing is that it has much more automation than RDS. So you have repacks, you have vacuums, you have re-index, you have benchmarks and many others to come tasks that are automated with a single YAML file or a click on the web interface that are not on RDS. Sorry, that is a bit slow loading, but um, at least I'm gonna quickly try to show you the, the screen where you can see uh, the, you know, the cluster. Yeah, so the cluster here is already created. Okay, so if we got a Postgres cluster here, I prefer dark mode, by the way. Right, we all agree on this. And it's being created the cluster, and just to finalize this, I'm just gonna connect to it quickly and finish the session today, because I think I'm out of time. But at least to demonstrate that we can, should I make it easier? Uh, exec, typing fast is a bad idea always. Uh, 
sorry. Uh, ah, yeah. Yeah, simple zero. And I'm about to show that there's a Postgres there, which was the first. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah. There we go. We've got our Postgres there. So just this, remember 10 lines of YAML code, got a Postgres created here. Uh, we've got this web interface that shows a Postgres cluster. If we would have been able to run the monitoring, we would have another pane here with the monitoring. We could see all the stats, all the dashboards with all the monitoring. Um, we have also backups if we would have configured them. Here's the log servers. And there, here we have this database operations that I said that are fully automated here. And if you look at this, we have benchmarks, vacuums, repacks, security upgrade, minor version upgrade, major version upgrade, restart, control restart. And you can just create these operations either via JAML or through the web console. And I think I'm going to stop here because I don't want to run out of time. Thank you very, very much. I'm obviously available if you have any questions or comments. And I really encourage you to run databases and containers, specifically in Kubernetes. And if you want to try this particular software, there's more, uh, which is fully open source. I really recommend you to go and go to the project open source and join the Slack channel where you can ask any question if something doesn't work for you or you want to have some suggestion. So thank you very much.